we are continuing our discussion on, uh, on uh, execution of transactions in database systems. Uh, we in fact looked at uh, various things uh, like uh, how the execution of the transactions should be controlled in the database systems to produce consistency results. In fact, transaction execution is one of the most uh, important things in database systems because it affects the performance of the system. Uh, if you typically notice uh, during the results time, you know when uh, CBSC results or state board results are announced, now a lot of people try to access the results through the net. In effect, if these results are stored more or less on a, on a database system, what um, you will realize is a large number of people simultaneously are trying to access these results at the same time. That is very important at the same time because everybody wants to know his result uh, or his what's result at the same time as somebody else because everybody is curious to know about their results. Now, this is the time when there are simultaneous hits on the database system. There is a large number of people who are trying to access these systems at the same time. Now, normally we notice that it is at these points of time the system fails. No, that is the time when it cannot respond to so many requests at the same time, which is equivalent to saying that the throughput of the system, the number of simultaneous users it can cater to is going to come down drastically. You know that is the time when the system will be challenged in terms of how many number of transactions it can process in a given point of time. That is per second, how many transactions were able to execute on your system. Another very interesting example is our railway reservation system. If you have noticed in the summer, there is a lot of people trying to book the railway tickets online or go to the counters and book their tickets. You can notice that the number of users trying to book their tickets in the last you know, couple of days, this being summer, seems to be peaking at 30,000 per day, which is you know. The system should be able to handle that many number of people simultaneously coming and trying to book their railway reservation uh, uh, simultaneously. So, database systems, one of the very critical things in database systems is how many number of uh, transactions the database is able to execute without losing consistency. You know, it is very important that if one user has booked his ticket somebody else simultaneously accessing the ticket overrides all the details and the same seat is allotted to two people at the same time. The same birth is given to two, two people. Then the system is in an inconsistent state. When one user is trying to book and he gets a birth, it should be guaranteed that no, nobody else is going to get the same birth. That is where basically we were trying to understand how the database actually solves this problem of trying to give as much throughput as possible and at the same time maintaining that uh, the consistency of the system state. This is the most important requirement of database uh, systems. What we did in the last class was we were looking at this uh, two phase locking as a very popular protocol that is employed by database systems to ensure that when uh, simultaneous transactions are executing, they log the data items. For example, in this case, if when what we were discussing a few minutes back on the railway reservation case, the birth will be for a particular train, if it is locked by one transaction, it will not be allowed to be locked by another transaction till this transaction finishes operating on that particular data item. That is how ex exactly the lock coordination is done by the transaction manager to ensure that more transactions can be executed, but at the same time consistency is ensured. Unfortunately, what, what we have observed in the case of two phase locking is besides it is being prone to deadlocks, because when you lock 
it is possible that two different transactions could have locked themselves in a different way and that could have resulted in a deadlock scenario. You know. And it is also possible that uh, since uh, the locks are released only after the commit point, it is possible that more throughput cannot be achieved by using two phase locking. That is where basically we see that two phase locking needs a lot of uh, you know, um, those kind of algorithms need a change to ensure a better throughput. Two phase locking certainly does not give that much throughput and so if you actually want to increase the transaction throughput possibly you should explore other algorithms as well. Now one of the uh, things that we did in the last uh, class was to actually classify the algorithms into optimistic uh, algorithms and pessimistic algorithms and uh, we showed that the optimistic class of algorithms we basically use what is called the time stamp based algorithms whereas in the pessimistic where basically the conflicts are more we said we are basically using uh, locking algorithms. This is what we actually did in the last uh, class and uh, we said we will continue to look at optimistic based algorithms in this class and we are going to look at typically the time stamp based algorithms. They are very popular algorithms in terms of producing a better throughput and I am going to compare both optimistic and pessimistic algorithms in a little more detailed fashion for a few minutes now and then get on to look at timestamp based algorithms in much more detail. But before we go into timestamp based algorithms, let us understand essentially the difference between pessimistic based algorithms and optimistic based algorithms. Now what really happens in the case of pessimistic and optimistic based algorithms is they are in two different spectrums in terms of what they actually do for checking the consistency of the database transactions. Notice that when actually we admit the transactions into the database, if you admit only those transactions that are going to be consistent, then you are actually doing an admission control for consistency in the beginning of the transaction execution. Now it is possible for you to let the transactions execute till the last point and uh, start doing for the consistency check for the transactions at the end of the execution. So it is possible for you to actually do the consistency check at the start of the execution versus the end of the execution. Okay. Now uh, if you basically do the check at the end of the execution, you typically waste the execution time of the transactions. For example, it is possible that a transaction is actually executed uh, up to its finish and it is at that point of time it is told that the execution is not consistent with respect to other transaction execution and uh, the transaction is aborted, then uh, it is like saying that you did lot of work but somebody says at the end of the work, no whatever you have done is not consistent so please come back again and redo whatever you have done. So that is one way of ensuring that you know uh, the consistency is, is applied at the end of the execution. On the other hand, everything that you do from the beginning, a teacher is by your side and is looking over your shoulders and looking at every step of what you are doing and if you actually took a uh, no, value that is not really correct value, he actually stops you at that point and says wait till you have the correct value and then you are executing, then basically that is what we actually see it as a very conservative way of executing the transactions. The other way of execution is let people proceed and let them submit to you at the end of the um, execution whatever they have done and now check whether what they have done is correct or not. When two people are simultaneously working, they assume wrong values, tell them that your thing is wrong because I have already accepted somebody who has actually done it before. Now you go back and redo assuming that this is the correct value. So it depends on 
where exactly this consistency criteria is actually applied. But if we assume lots of times they are not going to be any conflicts, the people are going to operate on different set of data items. It is possible for you to actually assume that the execution can be allowed to proceed independently and you can check for the consistency at the end of the execution. That is one uh, uh, approach. Uh, the other approach is to actually look at uh, these two ends of the spectrum seeing that one end of the spectrum is what uh, we are marking as, as the uh, optimistic end of the spectrum and the other end is what we are marking as the pessimistic end of the spectrum. Now, we have a number of protocols which lie in between this spectrum, this uh, full spectrum of uh, things that we have. What we have actually seen is the 2 p l in, in great detail and this falls under the pessimistic uh, side of the things. Uh, we have a variety of time stamping protocols, some of them can be seen to fall in a fully optimistic time stamping, fully optimistic protocols. There are uh, protocols which are uh, time stamp based algorithms which are not completely optimistic, they fall in between the pessimistic and the optimistic uh, protocols. What we are going to do is we are going to look at protocol called the basic time stamping protocol and then we will see how this protocol is different from the 2 p l locking kind of algorithms that we have seen earlier. What we will do when we study the basic time stamping algorithm is to understand how time stamp based protocols work in the concurrency control. Then we will modify this basic time stamping protocol to produce what we see as a fully optimistic version of the time stamping protocol. There are also other uh, protocols uh, more notably the multi version uh, protocols. It is possible to map it somewhere here the multi version uh, protocols. What they basically do is they produce multiple versions of the data item when uh, reads and writes are going on which means that they keep multiple copies of the data item being manipulated in the database and consequently you have what, what are called the multi version, multi -version uh, protocols, concurrency control protocols. One modification of the 2 p l, 2 phase locking protocol for multi version is the other thing that we are going to look at which is the multi version 2 p l is another algorithm that we are going to look at as part of the multi version protocols. We will look at a basic multi version protocol and we are also going to look at a two version locking protocol which is called the modified 2 p l for multi version protocols. What this actually shows is there is a whole gamut of algorithms as shown in this picture. If you basically look at the spectrum is quite wide in terms of the number of protocols that can be put in between the pessimistic and the optimistic uh, kind of algorithms. It depends to a large extent to what uh, side the algorithm should be applied depends to a large extent on the system configuration. For example, if you assume that there are going to be too many conflicts, the data items are going to be having many conflicts for particular data items, then it is not worth actually you know, putting optimistic uh, kind of protocols. 
on the other hand where there is not likelihood of lot of conflicts and you start mapping it to the uh, optimistic side uh, pessimistic side then you are likely to have I uh, know the throughput um, drastically comes down and it is not worth actually mapping or putting the pessimistic kind of algorithms into your database system. A good example here again is to look at what we see as you know uh, typically when a new movie is released a large number of uh, conflicts you know large number of people try to book for the same movie you know on a particular theater. If you also see there is going to be a choice for a particular uh, you know set of seats because the more preferred seats in the theater compared to other kind of seats in the theater. If you have visited a theater and you know many times you know which is a convenient place to sit and view your movie. What uh, in effect means is a large number of people when this new movie is released will try to book their tickets and many of them will start asking you know if you ask their preferences will start asking for those set of seats. That is basically high conflict uh, data items. If you basically look at the data items you view the chairs as data items you can see a large number of people trying to access or trying to uh, modify or manipulate a small set of data items and this is what we mean by the conflicts being very high for the uh, small percentage of data items. Now if this suddenly requires some kind of a concurrency control. Now in this particular case if you, uh, if you actually apply a pessimistic algorithm which ensures from the beginning that the transactions operate in a consistent way um, it works, works well because ultimately a single seat can be booked by only one, uh, one uh, customer. You cannot have multiple people trying to book for the same seat whereas if 10 people competed for this for the one ticket and ultimately 9 have to be aborted even if they are all gone ahead and then did whatever manipulations they have to do. But at the end the database is going to say only one of them can really get the ticket which means that 9 of them will abort after proceeding taking all the information they abort at the end. Whereas a pessimistic uh, concurrency control would have actually aborted all the other not would not have allowed the 9 to proceed from the beginning which means that the transactions would have been blocked from actually trying to manipulate the data item once it is actually booked. That is essentially the difference between optimistic and pessimistic uh, kind of an algorithms. What we are going to look at is look at a little deeper in this sense and understand what exactly is the, is the way this consistency is enforced by the pessimistic and optimistic algorithms as far as the transactions are concerned. Now what we will do is we will actually take a sample graph and start showing how this graph actually has grown if you typically look at the two cases of optimistic and pessimistic concurrency control. The idea of actually looking at this graph is to understand in a more deeper way how the consistency checks at different points will really help you, you know in terms of resolving the conflicts. As you can see in this diagram there is typically at this point of time there are a set of transactions which are executing with uh, in the same time sense that T1 which is actually before T2 and now which is basically before T3. There is uh, an order in which the transactions are trying to execute one after the other. Now if you keep a new transaction incoming transaction T4 now there are two points which we were talking in the graph one is the entry point and the other is the end point. 
Now T4, if you allow T4 to execute without really looking at you know what it is trying to do will be consistent or inconsistent. What would have happened is T4 would have proceeded to execute and when it comes at the end of the execution then you try figuring out whether whatever the transaction is trying to do makes sense or makes consistency you know whether it falls under the consistency criterion whether it satisfies the consistency criterion. Now all that it means is if this has to be satisfied if there is likely to be an arc you know something which shows that the T4 at the end of the thing has to actually T4 at the end of the uh, thing will have a precedence relationship which are shown here carefully follow the diagram to understand what we are actually trying to discuss here. There is a T4 that entered after I have this graph. Now where do I place this T4? If I am actually saying that T4 comes okay, after T3 this is fine because this is really does not disturb the order because T1 uh, comes before T2, T2 comes before T3, T3 comes before T, T4. So there is specific order in which things are happening for you and this is a correct order because one after the other there is a relationship that is maintained. But on some other conflicting data item if T4 has to come okay, before T1 which means that now I want to actually force a relationship on the graph something like this you would not be able to insert this relationship. Okay into the sequence of actions that you are doing and this actually violates the consistency which means that it would not be possible for me to no longer say this because from this the relation that I get is T1 is before T4 by the transitive relationship. This is like I ate breakfast then I ate lunch then I actually ate my uh, evening snacks. Now I cannot say suddenly my dinner comes after evening snacks but my actually my breakfast which is the first event that I have actually performed uh, occurs you know after my dinner okay that is what exactly is happening here which is a violative because by this relationship the breakfast should be coming before the dinner event but whereas I am saying that my dinner event comes before my breakfast event and this violates the consistency criterion because one after the other as you have actually able to see here one after the other the relation is correct as long as the future relations does not violate whatever order that I have been able to come with. If you uh, really understand what really we are trying to say in this graph is the following you know I have a set of transactions and when actually I, I write this relationships that I have here all that that is being talked about now is if there is a cycle in this graph it is violative of the consistency criterion because a cycle you cannot break this cycle to write one after the other what essentially this is showing is this is before relationship. Now what this is saying is T1 is before T2, T2 is before T3, uh, T3 is before T4. Now suddenly I am saying T4 is before T1 and this actually is what introduces the inconsistency into the execution of the transactions as one after the other. Essentially this uh, cycles in the transaction graph has to be avoided if you want to produce consistent um, execution of the transactions. Now understand what we will try to understand here is how does a pessimistic uh, kind of algorithms will uh, really try to solve this problem versus how optimistic uh, concurrency control algorithms tries to solve this problem. 
I will try use the same transaction graph to illustrate this point that an incoming transaction will first be mapped into the transaction graph by the 2 PL which means that it will never allow a transaction to be executed unless its position in the transaction graph is fixed by the algorithm which means that there is no way T4 could have executed in the 2 PL case once it starts executing this condition would have been checked. If this condition is not possible what 2 PL does is it essentially makes T 4's execution impossible ok. T 4 would not have executed T 4 cannot execute ok which means that I prevent T 4 from execution from the beginning ok. This is what we call as uh, we are basically not allowing disallow ok disallow the transaction from the beginning and this is what 2 PL would have done ok. Now, what the uh, optimistic uh, concurrency control algorithms will do is T 4 is allowed to execute ok, allowed to execute, but then it would have failed when it wants to commit T 4 cannot commit because at before commitment we basically check ok whether what T 4 has done is consistent or not which is the two spectrums that we are talking. This spectrum is where you do not allow it to happen in the beginning itself in the other case you allow T 4 to execute and then stop it from committing after it has executed it still cannot commit because it is violating the restrictions. Now, let us go a little deeper and understand this because this is basis for further discussion when we go on to time stamping algorithms also. What we will try to understand is how the 2 PL will disallow the transactions from executing from the beginning itself the consistency check will be done at the beginning itself and as I do this I will also try to informally prove by this that uh, 2 PL actually produces serializable schedules. Now, let us look at a set of conflicting operations ultimately a transaction uh, a transaction boils down to a set of operations performed by the transaction. For example, if you typically look at transaction T 1 the set of uh, operations this transaction performs and that can be O 1 to O n to get the correct sub subscript what I am going to do is I will actually make this order this operation with a subscript which is the transaction number in this particular case and under that I uh, will typically look at the further subscript which is the operation number ok. Uh, what this means is an operation i of j means that this is the ith transaction and the this is the jth operation. Since this is typically the first transaction that I am I am talking about what I am going to do is I will uh, try to make this just the 1 of j ok and this becomes operation 1 of n. And we will also to complete the notation what I will basically indicate also is the data item on which this operation is being performed. For example, you can indicate here this actually accesses or does something of uh, on x or y or whatever it is. Now, the meaning of this is uh, operation of first transaction this is the jth operation this is the manipulation the data item which is the x data item. This is the operation n of transaction 1 manipulating data item y. Now, what we will basically look at it is when this is executing in the context of a 2 PL you need to acquire a lock on this data item before you actually proceed on x or y because that is how 2 PL actually ensures that you are not operating unless you acquire a lock. Now, in this particular case you are, you are typically looking at 
two transactions that are executing simultaneously to understand how they could be manipulating. Now, let us say these are the sample transactions of 1 and 2 transactions T 1 and T 2. Now, we will say that at operation will be conflicting if it is actually operating on the same data item. What does this actually mean? If uh, in, a, in a case of banking transaction, if I go and withdraw cash from my account and somebody else is also simultaneously withdrawing cash from his account, not my account we both are essentially operating on our own individual accounts. There is no conflict in this particular case because he is operating on his account and I am operating on my account. The minute both of us go to the bank and try to withdraw the amount from the same account then we will be conflicting. Again if we both are looking at the balance amount that is available in the account we are still not conflicting because both of us simultaneously can view what is the current balance in the account without really withdrawing if you are just looking at the balance still you are not actually producing any inconsistent results. So, a simple read though it is on the same data item is still not conflicting. If either of us are withdrawing or both of us are withdrawing which means that if one of the operations is a right operation, if both are operating on the same data item in this particular case you can see both of these are actually operating on the same data item x. And if one of them is a right operation then only there will be a conflict because if I am withdrawing and he is looking at the current balance that is available in the account now it depends on whether he has read it after I withdrew it or before it. So, it starts now becoming a conflicting operation if one of it is actually a right. So, this is what we mean by two operations being conflicting. Now, only when operations are conflicting we need to worry about the order in which these operations have executed. If the operations are not conflicting for example, if two of us are withdrawing the money from two different accounts it does not really matter because we are just operating on two different accounts. But the minute actually we start operating on the same account we need to know what exactly happened with respect to that account who has first seen the account how much has been withdrawn by person x how was it actually added later by somebody else all these details one after the other needs to be there the after relationship is important otherwise there are going to be inconsistencies in the final result that you see as far as the account is concerned. So, when we actually look at T 1 and T 2 what we are interested in is if there is a conflict between T 1 and T 2 then only we are interested in finding out the relationship between T 1 before T 2 or T 2 before T 1. And this relation essentially boils down to looking at some operation of 1 and some operation of 2 and saying how these two conflicting operations have actually been executed with respect to each other. This is what we actually at the end of it interested to see T 1 before or T 1 after. Uh, for example, if one of it is a right operation then we say that it is conflicting as we just explained. Now, look at operation O 1 j and operation 2 2 j of T 1 and T 2. Since they are conflicting now if they are not conflicting we cannot write this order because they can execute in any order they, they actually uh, wish without really producing inconsistent results. If they are conflicting we have to understand which operation executed before the other based on that we are going to say the transaction T 1 is coming before T 2 or T 2 is coming before T 1. Now, what as an end of the series of execution if you typically look at 
Now I basically will take only the one uh, transaction suffix I will drop the actual operation suffix I will say two conflicting operations O1 and O2 belonging to T1 and T2 are executed in this particular order which means that there is an order of T1 before T2. Now imagine I have a conflicting O2 versus O3 for the third transaction which means that T2 executed before T2 executed before T3. Okay. Now if you look at another this is what we have actually looked at O4 this means that T3 is executed before T4. Now look at the discussion that we actually had uh, a while ago on the transaction graph this is what exactly happened in our transaction graph we are just proceeding one after the other but when we actually came to T4 what really is happening was we are trying to say O4 also has a conflicting operation with O1 but these were executed in this particular way which actually means that this is the order that would have happened and which is what actually produces the inconsistent results. Now if you basically look at 2 PL should this execution would have happened if I consider 2 PL. Now O1 would have actually locked the data item let us say this is a, the conflicting operation is defined here on some data item X that I will indicate it here which means that there is a lock on data item X which was obtained by O1. Okay. Now let us say there is a conflicting operation between O2 and O3 on data item Y which means that in this particular case the lock was obtained by O2 before O3. Now let us say there is a conflicting operation Z here okay, and on which actually we have got a lock on Z for O3 because if the lock was not obtained this sequence is not possible because a transaction will never execute in the case of 2 PL unless the lock was granted. So T1 would not have been able to execute unless it has obtained a lock on X because between O1 and O2 conflicting T1 has got the lock before T2 that is the reason why this relationship is possible otherwise this relationship is impossible you cannot have the relation as shown in this particular e equation here right. Now let us say there is between T4 and T1 let us say there is an item data item A this is does not fit into the regular sequence that is why I am using a different x y z is a sequence A is out of the sequence. Now between O4 and O1 there is a conflicting operation being performed on A right. Now O4 is saying that it log it got the lock on A before O1. Now for a minute think is this possible in 2 PL what O1 what transaction T1 would have done is it actually requires a lock on X a lock on A right before it starts executing. Now what this set of equations I have here says is I have got a lock on X now O2 would not have got transaction T would not have got unless I release this lock to it which means that I should have released the lock on X before getting the lock on A because O2 is saying that it has actually got a lock on Y before O3. Similarly O3 is saying I have got a lock on Z before O4 but O4 is saying that now I got lock on A before O1 right. If you carefully understand this unless this lock is released by T1 T2 would not have got that lock unless T2 has got that lock it would not have actually proceeded to get the other lock on Y. So if you actually use this equation we are writing here 
is uh, inconsistent because 2 p l prevents this by saying if I have a lock I would not release that lock till I get all the other locks. Remember the condition that was imposed by 2 p l it says that <coughs> unless all the locks are obtained you do you are not going to release the previous lock that is what we meant by the lock point right. All the locks will be obtained the 2 p l finishes the transaction finishes the execution then it basically releases the locks. If you release one lock you are not supposed to ask any more locks with that condition if I release lock x I would not have asked for lock on a which means that transaction T 2 would not have been able to execute unless I finished all the executions. Since T 2 would not have got a lock till I finish there is no way T, T 4 can say it has actually come before me and obtained lock a lock on a if this is the way it is it is supposed to execute. This is intuitively what happens with 2 p l and that is essentially the reason why this important condition is put in 2 p l saying that if you actually release one lock you are not expected to ask for any more locks. If that is not followed we would have ended up actually having this problem the cycle in the transaction graph would have would have happened if I allowed this condition that x could be released but still you can ask for a that is what actually is prevented in 2 p l saying that once you have a lock on x you have to ask for lock a before you release any of the locks that you have acquired earlier because if you release one lock you cannot ask for any more locks this essentially prevents the cycle in the transaction graph. This explanation makes you understand how 2 p l checks for the consistency at the entrance and the transaction is trying to start executing how 2 p l ensures the consistency requirement. Once the transaction starts executing and it starts getting the locks there is no way you can say the transaction is inconsistent it will never get into an inconsistent state of execution. What really happens in this particular context is the transaction can get blocked when it gets blocked this results in a scenario of a transaction either you know permanently waiting if there is a deadlock kind of a scenario or waiting for sufficiently long to acquire a lock, but the transaction will never start executing unless it is in a consistent state. There are certain issues which relate to what is the overhead of this kind of an algorithm which we will discuss towards the end of the time stamping based algorithms. The other issue is when you actually move to the end of the execution and want to check for the consistency how exactly that is going to be done. Now we will look at typically the scenario there and see what are the possibilities of that being done and how that will be that will be done in the case of optimistic scenario. Now what really happens in the in the case of an optimistic algorithm is we basically take a transactions data items on which it is basically operated ok. This set of data items which are actually manipulated in this particular case is going to be a set. So, this set is going to be x and a in the earlier case this is the set which transaction t 1 has actually manipulated. T 2 actually manipulated a set of data items relating to y and probably some other set. If you take t 4 this is a set which we get here a and probably some other set. Now, when T 4 wants to commit T 4 can just execute whatever it wants to do T 4 executes. Now, it says I want to commit that is basically when it is trying to write the values of A back on the database. This is the at the commit point what you are going to do is you check for the values of A and say whether whatever previous things done by the other transactions are consistent with respect to this. If the 
this is basically what we say as the validation check. The validation check is done at the end and if the T4 passes the validation then I actually allow T4 to commit. What happens in the case of a, a purely optimistic kind of a scenario? The, every transaction is allowed to proceed. What really happens in this case is the transaction takes values, does it in a local uh, copy of the data item and manipulates whatever it needs to do on the local copy and when it actually finally wants to write you perform this validation at the end of it. I will give only an intuitive explanation at this stage to allow you to understand what is happening here, but more detailed discussion is going to follow when we actually take up the time stamping algorithms which are the optimistic case of the time stamping algorithm. We will go into in depth seeing how exactly this, this works. To give an intuitive explanation of the optimistic scenario, what is done in this case is let us say four people are trying to uh, do simultaneously something. Each one will be given a local copy, this is like four people, okay, four people in this case as you can see the transaction T1, T2, uh, T3 and T4. Okay. Now all the four transactions here will, uh, will be allowed to proceed by taking a local copy from the database. Okay. Now T, uh, 2PL would have said I am going to order all of you and then you have to get in with, the, with respect to the tickets that I have given you. T1 is number 1. T2 is number 2, T3 is number 3 and T4 is number 4. So that is the way they are going to execute. Now I basically will not bother to give them a ticket when they actually arrived at my place. What I will say is you actually try doing whatever you want to do. That means each one will get a local copy of the data item. In this particular case as you can see T3, uh, T1 and T4 will get a copy of A. Okay. In this case it is going to be A and X, this is going to be Y, this is going to be Z and other values. Now when you actually finish doing something, for example let us say all the values are produced by each one of them, they at the end of it submit to me. When they finish execution they submit whatever they have done to me. Now I will look at what is called validate, this validate phase is going to look at if this problem of A being done in an inconsistent way by T1 and T4 will be detected at this stage. For example, this will show me that there is something which T1 done, did on A which is inconsistent with T4. How can that happen? For example, what we will say here is T1 has actually manipulated the value of A with some particular let us say 1 is a manipulated value. Uh, T1 actually manipulated a value of X to 2 which actually has been used by T2 and T2 has actually manipulated the value and produced a value 3 which is actually used by okay. and now T3 manipulated this value to 4 which is used by. Okay. Now, this is actually manipulated this to 3 and it is actually to be used by T1. This is where exactly this problem of I have actually should not have used this and manipulated because I am coming after, but with respect to A T1 actually has taken T force value and manipulated it to 1. Please understand this little more carefully. I actually did something and produced a value for X equals to 2 and that value is used by T2. Okay. This is like I, I did something in my paper and passed it on to the next person T2, T2 used that value and produced a value for Y and this Y value is passed to T3 and he used that value to produce a value for Z and that is given to T4, but T4 actually given a slip to T1 before this for A which actually means that there is a cycle here. Who is now 
took whose result? It is difficult to say because is T4 seems to have fed to A1, A1 seems to have fed to A2, uh, T2 like this if you basically look at it. This is what actually produces the inconsistency and this will be what is what will be detected when they submit their values to me. In the case of 2 PL, they will not be allowed to proceed to execute and produce these values, but in the case of optimistic algorithms, they will be allowed to proceed, they will be allowed to do this manipulations, but when they give the values to me, when I look at them, I can see that this is violating the property of consistency which is essentially the cycle in this particular graph. So, what the validate phase does in the case of optimistic algorithms is essentially check this dependency at the end of the execution and say that now T4 should be aborted. T4 actually has produced a value. Okay. So, I basically abort all those transactions which has actually produced inconsistent results and I will say that T1 and T4 should restart the execution and again they will take the new values from the database and starts executing. Uh, this is what will happen in the optimistic scenario. Now, the problem here is as you can see in the case of a pure pessimistic kind of an algorithm T4 would not have wasted its time computing something because I have used some value and I tried computing. So, I actually sat down worked out everything, but at the end of it I submitted my value and I was told you are inconsistent because you used inputs which are not correct. So, you go back and redo what you have done. So, there is basically a loss of execution time you have actually unnecessarily executed T4 and uh, found out that at the end of the uh, day T4 did not use the correct value. So, it has to abort and it has to restart whereas, this will never would not have happened at all in the case of uh, 2 PL or pessimistic kind of algorithms because uh, they would have been asked to read all these values in the correct way before they even start executing the transaction. So, in that sense the pure pessimistic kind of algorithms would not have allowed this scenario where the aborts are required. Whereas, in the case of a optimistic you let things proceed, but then at the end of the thing you check whether what they have done is correct or not. Both have as you can see here both have the plus and the minus. If, uh, the, if you expect T1, T2, T3, T4 in this particular case this diagram you can see they generally operate. For example, the scenario what we, we actually assume here is that uh, a large number of transactions generally operate you know, on uh, different data items not on the same data items. Okay. That means, this is going to be x, this is going to be y, this is going to be z and this is going to be p and there is completely disjoint sets. Okay. Then you can see that at the end of it they can all go very, very simply you know without really locking anything because the locking overhead is reduced here. At the end of the validation phase they all proceed smoothly because they are not actually conflicting. This is one case where all of them are using different doors, different keys. So, all of them pass the validation phase. This is what you will see if you apply a optimistic scenario. Try to apply a purely pessimistic scenario in this particular case to see what would have happened. Let us say most of the time all of these transactions operate only on one data item <coughs> which actually means that it is possible for only one of them to be able to proceed if they are actually conflicting which means that all of them will tend to do the same data item but only one of them will be able to go whereas, in the other case all of them will be able to go which in effect means that you have to go back and then start reworking out for T2, T3, T4. There is going to be a large number of aborts okay, if you apply 
where there are large number of conflicts if you apply pessimistic algorithm there is going to be a large number of aborts of the transaction and this results in wasted time. Okay. In this particular case you can see only one of them have a chance of proceeding because all of them are conflicting. Now if you actually applied a pessimistic kind of a scenario you know that one of them can only succeed in getting a lock which means that you would have you know serialized them one after the other with respect to this conflicting data item and they all coming here and trying to rush through this door would not have happened you know. They will get the key one after the other this is the case of actually they, they are trying to hit each other now if, if you basically apply the locking there is going to be an organized lock on this data item x which is something like this uh, lock is going to be this is the key for the for the for the data item and this key is going to be used passed to one after the other and you can see they all can use this data item one after the other and there is going to be not going to be a conflict after they start executing. This is uh, the other case of applying the pessimistic scenario. This lecture what we did is we essentially looked in depth the difference between optimistic kind of algorithms and pessimistic kind of algorithms. Both have their place in terms of in terms of application where it should be where there are contentions very low there is no point trying to apply pessimistic algorithms where there are large number of you know conflicts there is no point trying to apply an optimistic algorithm. So, both actually have their place in fact what we are going to see in the next few lectures is the whole gamut of algorithms that fall in between which also produce excellent results when they are applied to transaction processing systems. In the next lecture we are going to take a basic time stamping scheme and look at in detail. Thank you.